Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. This is Morning Prayer Live, and I'm Bishop Winston Watson. I uh, just want to welcome you to our get-together, our devotional this morning. And, uh, you know, I want to pray God just touches you, touches your heart, touches your life. I want us to especially lift up a family this morning. <coughs> and that is um, Gail and Bob Conan. Ted John, and I don't, I don't um, know the names um, of the other members of the family, but there are a few. Um, I know her little granddaughter, seen her many a time. But um, lifting up that family today because they lost their grandma and uh, the interment, uh, the ceremony and service, celebration of life will be tomorrow, Friday. And, uh, you know, we want to really encourage them. Uh, a season is over, but it's now for them to carry on and them to share the legacy of grandma. And, uh, you know, at the end of our lives, sometimes, you know, we are sometimes probably the more challenging to our family members, probably. And, uh, and Gail has really been through it, you know, with, with, with Bob, you know, over the last few months, you know, with grandma and with some other issues you know, with family and, uh, you know, talking about, you know, with the COVID issues and so on. Couldn't see grandma very often and all of that. But I want to really lift them up this morning and pray the peace of God on them, as we do for everyone else. Also praying peace for Stephanie this morning, who is recuperating well, you know, from a little bout of, you know, of some stomach issue that she had. And uh, we thank God for her deliverance, her answer. And then also, anyone that has had an issue, 
you know, people have asked me over the last few days, Pastor, tell me more about this issue of blessing and curses. Are someone, one person asks very specifically, are curses real? Well, guess what? They are indeed real. And uh, we walk around in ignorance, not realizing what, you know, we are under. And we repeatedly do things um, and, and foster or create an atmosphere for the negative things to, um, to grow uh, in our lives because we nurture them. But this morning, we are not nurturing negative things. We are nurturing the presence and the purpose of God in our life and the blessing, the generational blessing that is ours. Amen. <clears throat> generational blessings are even more powerful than generational curses. Generational blessings come from heaven. Um, I, I do want to address an issue though that just occurred in Jamaica and then move into our study this morning, which is God is God like you and like me. Is God like you and I? Um, but before I go there, let's talk a little bit about an Old Testament man who was the priest in, in the city um, and who had two sons uh, that were priests with him. Um, these priests were, let's call them in the church, uh, because the synagogue at the time was a precursor to what we know as the church also. And so they were in the synagogue. They were the priests that were in charge of uh, the temple rites. They were the priests that took in the offering um, and made the sacrifices to God. Um, they were the priests that looked after the finances of the temple. <clears throat> and it came to the knowledge of the dad, the, the priest um, father, uh, that his sons were not doing right by God, or by him for that matter. And uh, what they were doing, for example, if someone would bring in a particular piece of meat for sacrifice, that was not to be given to anybody, um, but, but be made a sacrifice on the altar of sacrifice, well, what these young men would do would take the best of the best of the best for themselves. Um, they were frolicking around with the woman and they were doing all manner of things. And it came to dad's knowledge that this was going on. Dad meaning the earthly priest's knowledge that they were doing these things, but he, he did nothing about it. And eventually what happened was that he died. And he died, you know, a not so nice death because of his disobedience and his reluctance to do what is right. And... Uh, it is so unfortunate that today, you know, according to the book of Ezekiel, and I think around the eighth chapter, it says, you know, that we unfortunately are doing some of the same things because we say that God is not around. God is not seeing these things. You know, a lot of us will try to get away with things when we don't believe people are watching, when we don't believe people are seeing. You know, we will hide and we will, you know, uh, and, and do things and, you know, and we do it with a certain amount of impunity because we say, well, hey, nobody's seen this. <clears throat> In Jamaican terminology, we call it a bligh. We get a bligh because we, we drive through the gas station because there's no cop on the corner. And so we don't have to stop at the stop sign or the, you know, the red light, you know, at that time. And uh, we have to realize that there's a consequence to our actions. Whatsoever, whatsoever a man soweth, he shall also reap. And so over the last couple of days, well, over the last uh, maybe year and a half, there has been an issue in Jamaica that, you know, has really irked my conscience. I-R-K-E-D. Challenged my conscience. Really... Um, made me want to talk out, and I haven't really said anything about it, but it's been in my, my mom would say, it's been in my craw <laughs> for a while. Uh, it's just been in there for a while, and I have had to um, kind of just keep it subsided and pray, you know, for the victim. There is a little 12-year-old girl, you know, that attended a church in Kingston um, with her sister and her mother, and, uh, you know, it was one of these Pentecostal, you know, Holy Ghost, fire-baptized churches. As a matter of fact, 
if you remember me telling you the story of one of my boys that came into church and he was out there and um, just knocking over chairs and so on. This is the same church that this young man attended <coughs> before he um, came to live with me. And anyway, and so this young girl is going to church and the pastor, um, or the bishop, I, I gather that he's a bishop, uh, he decided that he was going to kind of bring them under his wing, so to speak. And uh, so he brought them under his wing and he began to, you know, take the little girls out, the older one and then the younger one, take them out for shopping and eating, you know, just like pretty much I would do with, with, with my kids. I mean, I do that all the time. I've taken my girls, my girls in church in Kingston, for example, would come over even here, they would come over to the house, you know, we would bake together, we would laugh together, we would, you know, run outside and play games together. But I would never consider doing some things that I hear people do. And uh, unfortunately, what some people do paints a broad brush for the rest of us. Uh, we have boys that come to my home all the time. My brother, you know, um, shared with me, um, and we had him call me pastor. He said, Winston. You better watch it because people will talk about you and talk about this. But, you know, you have to know your integrity. You have to know what's right and what you're doing is right already. <clears throat> so that, you know, you don't, you're not, your conscience is not bothered by someone's opinion. But let it be only their opinion. Let it not be your action, amen, that uh, somebody recognizes. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, has, the, you know has, has an evidential ability to show well you really did this amen because you have to have a conscience toward god i'm talking about the minister the man of god you have to have a con there's nobody watching over you like that god is there but he's not slapping you every single thing you do that might be incorrect he's not coming into your life and and you know messing with your life immediately but there's a consequence you know to each one of us when we perform things that are inconsistent with the nature or the integrity of God. So this man took this 12-year-old girl out, <coughs> and they, eventually she became pregnant. You may already have gone to the end of the story. Um, she became pregnant, and uh, she said that, or her sister, I think, might have reported it. She said that it was the pastor that impregnated her, and he swore up and down along with the church that it was impossible, it was not him. So, you know, inevitable, inevitable, we do DNA tests. So they did a DNA test, and it turned out that it was his child by the DNA test. Well, he refuted that DNA test and says that's impossible. And so they requested another DNA test, so they did another DNA test, and he says it's impossible. I think. What's going on is that he's praying and he's fasting and uh, others around him, I guess intercessors are around him, praying and fasting that these tests will come back and prove that he was not the one that impregnated the child. Well, they just had a, I, I believe it's a third DNA test. Wasting the court's time. Um, wasting the DNA processing and the money that has been paid. I think he might have paid it himself. But it's very foolhardy and foolish, you know, for him to do that. When the DNA test has come back again, that he father, fathered this, the, the baby that this 12-year-old um, uh, has had. Now, my friends, this is like the man of old. And uh, the, the man of old that I was talking about was Eli. This man today, um, over in Kingston, this past violated a 12-year-old child, one of the most vulnerable, vulnerable um, individuals in our society. And uh, we, the church, are apt to say, well, we need to forgive him. Well, the church may need to forgive him, but civil law needs to be applied against him. He needs to go to jail, and he needs to have every ounce every inch whatever it is of penalty applied to his life because he is held to a higher standard and a higher regard just like you and just like me we have to learn as men and women of god as christians 
that we can't do everything everybody does. Even if they do it and get away with it, we can't do those things. We can't even entertain the thought. You know, there are some things that we have entertained in life. And every thought that is entertained will usually, at some point in time, manifest in an action. And we cannot allow our minds. We, you see, you and I are in control. <clears throat> it is not like the man on the outside of the kingdom. If you're not a Christian today, well, you know, you on the outside of the kingdom, your mind is really, for the most part, under no control. It is under the control of the enemy. But when you're a Christian, you ought to have the mind of Christ. And you have the mind of Christ because you are taking time to be in the word of God, to pray, to be in the presence of God, to worship. You are around people that encourage you in doing these things. And then this helps you to maintain focus, to maintain the thoughts of the good things in Christ, to maintain the thoughts of self-control. You know, those things that the Bible talks about, you know, the fruit, the fruit of the spirit. <clears throat> and one of those is what? Self-control. It is an ability to control your emotions, an ability to control your urges, an ability to control the very thoughts that would lead to an action inconsistent with the nature of God our Father. And so, and so then it's important for us, you know, to, to refocus and look at these things. Now, this, this child, and I think she's probably around 15 now, um, she has, she has, you know what, she has something in her life. If she goes on to get married, you know, is she, if the Lord had, had intended her to marry a pastor or intended her to have a relationship with a minister or any man for that matter, okay, she has been violated. And uh, she now has the potential of having a lack of trust for men. You know, I don't know what her mother's role in all of this was, but you think about it and think about her sister and those around. How trustworthy are the men of God around them um, from their perspective after this, after these events have unfolded in their lives? How trustworthy, you know, is the word of a man of God when people encounter these things. How trustworthy trustworthy, is the word of a man of God when a man of God has stolen from you? You know, one person came to me many years ago. She was, a, you know, um, she was not Jamaican by birth. She had come to Jamaica from one of the other islands and she came and she said um, the pastor borrowed money from her, um, almost $100,000 Jamaican dollars many years ago now, it's a lot of money. He borrowed from her. She was a single woman working in Jamaica, saving her money, and he did so. And when she went to him for her money, he cursed her out. His board members um, told her off. And by the way, this is not hearsay. I know the pastor that borrowed it. I know the board members <laughs> that talked about it. I knew the church very well. And so I have had firsthand knowledge, and I had to minister to this woman, you know, who was so violated by the pastor. Um, I've had other young people, another young lady came to me and confessed, you know, that, you know, the pastor raped her. These are things, my friends, that I cannot, I cannot imagine that a man of God or a woman of God, you know, because it's not just men doing these things. Well, you hear more so about men, but, but you ca I cannot imagine a man or a woman of God violating the trust of those that are in their charge. This morning, I want us to collectively, to, as, as a body of believers, pray for the protection. Now, <clears throat> we pray for the wisdom of pastors, but also pray for the protection of our children. Pray for the protection of our vulnerable ones or older ones that men are stealing funds from. Pray for the protection of our older ones and mature ones, the orphans now and the widows. Pray for them that they will not be violated 
by any white man, any woman. The world will violate them, but we can't allow the church to do that. My God. We can't allow the church to mess up people's lives and to alienate them from the family of God. You know, we have to be an encouraging body of believers. We have to be the strength for the weak. We have to be the ones that are there to put a good word, of, we use the term prophecy in our Bible study, to encourage, to edify, and to comfort those around us. And again, when we violate the hearts of men, when we violate the trusts of men, how then will they be comforted and edified? You know, and built up by what? By what you and I say when they don't know who to trust. We are children of God. Let the trust level truly be there for all of those that are in our charge. We are not the stewards over money, where we take money in and we are a blessing with food and supplies and all these things. We are also stewards of the lives of men. We are stewards of the souls of men. Every man, every woman, every boy or every girl that we have violated, their blood is on our head. If we have <coughs> caused them to sin, if we have caused them to do things inconsistent with the relationship with God, and if we have set them up for failure in their Christian walk, some people will not want to grace the door of a church because they say every pastor is this way or every deacon is this way or every minister is this way. It's not so and the broad brush approach does not lend itself to um, a sound fellowship and relationship in the body of Christ. But it is because of a man's action that has created the atmosphere of distrust. We need a restoration of trust. For revival to come, there must be a restoration of trust. A restoration of trust in the man of God or the woman of God so that there is a restoration of trust in God. Because people say, well, God, how can you do that? How can you allow him to do that when you know the hurt that it will cause in that child? But you see, my friends, God doesn't twist our arms. We are, as many people say, we are free agents and we make choices and we make decisions. Sometimes they are right decisions and sometimes they are not so right decisions. Sometimes the decisions eventually merit um, penalties from civil law. Nevertheless, let us look at ourselves today and make decisions that are right in the sight of God. Amen. We are people that are under, clearly, under a new covenant. My God. And the new covenant... The new covenant is or comes to us when we have accepted Christ's sacrifice. For you and I to submit our life under his authority, we enter into a new level of relationship, a new level of power, a new level of understanding. And I'm not just talking about intellectual prowess or intellectual comprehension of some words in a book. I am not just talking about understanding what Pastor Watson says from the perspective of the English language or the particular language that is available to you that you have heard me if I've been to Indonesia um, where I've been and a, a translator, you know, our interpreter, you know, interprets what I've said, you know, to the people and they've heard it in their own language. It is not because there's an understanding from that perspective that creates in me a covenant relationship. It is the spiritual insight 
It is the inner man, the spirit man's change. You see, you see me, I am flesh and blood and bone and all of these things, you know, that make up who Pastor Watson, who Winston Watson is, is a mere outside um, envelope for what's on the inside, which is a more powerful entity. It is the spirit of man that's on the inside that God uh, entitles, <clears throat> that God empowers, that God gives the ability to be. And notice I'm not ending the statement with anything but, but that he gives us the ability to be. To be everything that he has designed. To be everything that he has wanted us um, to fulfill. To be and to do. He says he, he has an intention for us. Jeremiah 29 says that he knows us. And he has prepared things for us. And he wants us to experience good things. But we have to make a choice. The covenant relationship that we have with him. Um, it's with a God that is really not like us. Because we would react, but he does not react. He is tempered. Um, he is systematic. He is logical. He processes. And he gives us opportunity with the ability of grace to make and change the decision of life. He gives us opportunity to step back and rethink our position. He gives us the opportunity to step back and think through things that we may have uh, been ready to do and for us to change and adjust and to move into a new thought process, into a new atmosphere. I am limiting our messages on in the morning to so about a half an hour because of a, an issue with Facebook. And so I'm coming to the end of this morning's message or this morning's talk or this morning's exhortation or this morning's words of edification. You know, whatever you want to use to describe it. We need to really absorb the word of God. We need to really absorb the life of we need to begin to, to get rid of that old man that has been in control of our lives for so long. The old thoughts, the old ways, the trickery, my God. In Jamaica, we call it the banduloism, where we think of tricking everybody. We think of getting by only because we can, you know, we can let somebody, you know, by tricky code and mirrors, we get somebody to do something for us because of our methods, not because of our faith, not because of our heart condition, but we do so because we trick somebody. There's a minister here in Galena um, that said something to me many years ago. Um, she said, um, in order for people, we were talking about raising money for ministry. And she said, in order for people to give, you have to, you know, touch their emotions and you have to make sure you do this. And, you, and she went down a litany of things that she uses as methods to get those that subscribe to her ministry. Um, you know, methods that she uses to get them to give to the ministry. And I thought about it. And I was, as a matter of fact, I had meetings with my board and my people. And I said, you know, you know in my mind I was saying, you know, these are some good things. These are some good methods. And then the Lord said, um, are those methods of me? And I took every one of the things that the individual said and I put them away. And I said, God, I believe in you. I don't believe. And I believe in the things you give us to do and not in these methods that we try to trick people and trick their emotions and trick them in their minds um, for them to do this or do that. Amen. Let's walk in integrity. Let's walk as children of the living God. Let's walk as people 
that know him, love him, and then, in concert, love those around us. I look at my men here working, you know, on the campus. And I just um, hired, we just hired a couple of teenagers yesterday, you know, to come. And one of them is a very challenged young man in many areas. And he comes every once in a while and asks, you know, for me to help him with food and so on. So yesterday we told him that we're going to hire him. Amen. <laughs> and so he's going to be here starting on Monday working, you know. And I said to him, he asked me if I could give him a few dollars. I said, well, yes, but this is an advance on your pay for next week. And so he kind of smiled and he looked. And uh, I could tell he felt good he has a job. Amen. He felt good that somebody trusts him enough to give him an opportunity. So let us walk with that level of integrity where people will now also trust us. That we are doing the right thing by them. We are encouraging them and we are allowing them to live for God because we live for God and we want to demonstrate the love the grace and the mercy of Christ. This is Morning Prayer Live, coming to you from St. Mary, this beautiful parish on the island of Jamaica in the Caribbean Sea. And uh, you all have a wonderful day. Those of you who are in cold country, we pray for the warmth of heaven you know, around you. And those of you who don't have electricity today in the United States, you know, we are praying for them also. They may have generators running or whatever it is out there, but we thank God that that is short-lived and that their power systems come back on the grid pretty quickly in the mighty name of Jesus. May God bless you, my friend. Have a wonderful Thursday and let grace abound in your life. We'll continue with this tomorrow. The covenant God. Is God like you? Is God like me? Mm. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Amen. <laughs>